And hello, everybody. Um, we're going to be doing a little lecture on or discussion uh, talking about how militarism uh, impacts natural rights. And it definitely does. Um, one of the foundations of this course is the idea that all people in world history, and as we study world history, is that natural rights exist. Natural rights are not given to you by your government. They're given to you by an invisible force, whether you believe it's God, nature, however it is. And that governments exist. The concept of democracy, of modern democracy in the Western world, in the United States, England, France, that started the idea of, of um, self-government and of you know the um, idea of democracy in, within a state, whether it's a republic or a commonwealth, whatever, is that government's role is to protect these rights. And that's their biggest responsibility, their sole role. And we're going to look at how militarism, with its natural outcome of war, affects natural rights. This has been written even before John Locke did so in the 17th century. Pericles, who was the leader of the city-state of Athens, the birthplace of democracy, talked about how war at times is necessary, but it must be an exception to the rule and must be quickly decided because it destroys the concept of democracy. So this is not something I came up with while thinking one day. This is something that the founders of the concepts of democracy and of natural rights have really thought about and written about for many years. So the idea of militarism is this. This is the ultimate idea of militarism. It's a belief that the use of military force is politics by other means. It's just a process. It's no different than talking and discussing what to do. When you're at an impasse, the concept of militarism means that we'll go to war for this. It's, that's understandable. Wars happen sometimes. Wars maybe are unavoidable. We talk often in, in this class about when might war be justifiable, and there is a difference of opinion, and that's okay. Difference of opinions, as long as you can substantiate them, as you if you have a basis for them in thinking and in thought, are important to have freedom. But the idea that military force is always on the table as a means of politics, how does it compare to the concept of every every human being's right to life, liberty, and property? Well, let's look at life. When put to its simplest terms, as an American general once said, war means fighting, and fighting means killing. When you're put into a situation of war, the state is saying that they have the right for you to, for you to give up your life to protect your nation state. That is a profound right that they possess. It is the ultimate power of the state, of the government, that they have a right to make you put, to put you in a position that you have to sacrifice your life. Beyond that, the state is saying by going to war, they have the right to make you kill somebody who you don't know, who is not a politician, who is just someone like you, a normal person. This is the ultimate power of government, is its war powers, how they believe they have the right to direct war and to put their citizens in risk of their life or force them to take life. The second aspect is, how does war fare? Militarism, put to its extreme, affect liberty. Liberty is this, basically. I can do as I choose as long as I do not hurt anyone. That was clearly defined in particular in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was the keystone of the French Revolution, which they did not follow at times. My rights extend as long as I don't break the law and harm you. Well, liberty is definitely affected by militarism because of the concept of conscription, which every nation has done. Now, the United States has said we don't have conscription. Well, we not had a major troop deployment like the last time was Vietnam where we had over one million combat troops in Southeast Asia and there was conscription going on and it was usually limited to those who were not in the economic high ground because certain people would be giving exemptions and typically you needed money to get those exemptions. 
Conscription means this. You're going about your life. You're living life as you please. You're not hurting anybody. You're exercising liberty. And the government says, we have the right to stop your life, put on hold, grab you, enforce that you go into the military service. And if you don't, we can send you to prison. And if you don't fight, if you show cowardice or fear in battle, you have the right to be shot by your government. Conscription is one of the most severe encroachments on human liberty and then forcing someone to be in a position where they have to kill somebody or be killed. Now the last concept is property. It might seem venal, but think of think of your thing and think of what happens to um, places in war. I'm showing here just a small bit of the city of Verdun in 1918. This was after one artillery barrage. Um, this was not, it looked a lot worse afterward. These are homes. These are small businesses. These are the places that people invested their life in. This was their home. The concept of home goes back far beyond even natural rights. The idea that every person should enjoy safety in their home. And Verdun was fought over a hundred years ago. Think of what has happened to other places. Every place that has war, people's homes, their lives are destroyed. This is just an impact of war. Warfare militarism is the polar opposite of the concepts of natural rights. Let's just give you some facts about the United States. The United States Constitution says that the president may go to Congress and request that a state of war exists between two nations. The last time we did so was 1941 in World War II, and certainly an understandable request and certainly an understanding vote. We were attacked at Pearl Harbor. Since that time of 1941, though, America has basically been at war. Look at the timeline. Without a declaration of war, 1950 to 1953 in Korea, which was a brutal war and mostly fought by conscripts. Vietnam, 1962 to 1973. The average combat soldier's age was 19 in the Vietnam War. In World War II, it was 26. And most of these were conscripts. The Middle East, since 2001 to the present, has been going on for over 20 years, a low-grade war that's never been declared. It's cost six point, as of 11-19, or November 2019, it's cost the United States taxpayers $6.4 trillion. That's property. And the construct is, if a, war is if, if a nation doesn't feel that it must declare war, what is the proper use of military force in a political world? I am not anti-war. I try to never give an overt opinion. I served our country. I was a combat soldier. My son was a combat soldier. You know, um, I certainly understand the need to have a military force and at times to use it. But the question is, should it be glorified to the extent that it is today? Closing question, why will there be a flyover of jet planes, of military hardware that cost millions of dollars, at the Super Bowl this year. What does that have to show about football? It's showing the glorification of the military. So I hope this makes you think, and I really do wish you to have a great day, and to remember that we learn history so that we can become better citizens, because your citizenship, I hope, is something that is of high value to you. Have a great day.